some key areas, three key areas that are important for your machine to pay attention to. Uh, we'll also talk about some specific tasks you can do that are included in the preventive maintenance routine. Um, we'll talk about when to call in the professionals <clears throat> when it gets beyond what you might be comfortable doing. And then uh, hopefully we'll have some time for a Q&A session. So during the, during the um, uh, session, uh, which is going to be recorded, by the way, um, and then we'll send it out to you for your reference as well as uh, make it available for some other DMS customers. <clears throat> during our uh, initial speaking, if you have questions, uh, you can go ahead and submit your question in the chat box window, and uh, we'll get to it when we get to the Q&A. Um, so my name is Greg Schultz. I manage the service department here at Diversified Machine Systems. And with me, I have Pete Vassar, who is one of the key production managers in our factory. Uh, also assisting us off camera is Jay Paycheck, who is our marketing manager here at DMS. So we wanted to talk about the three, uh, start off this webinar with speaking about the three maintenance areas that really uh, will extend the life of your machine if you pay attention to them. And we wanted to cover the basics of those. I would advocate that these three areas need daily attention. Um, and the first one is lubrication. And so I'll turn that over to Pete. Yeah, so <clears throat> when we talk about lubrication, uh, we're talking about uh, rails, bearings, runner blocks, lead screws, uh, ball nuts, and rack and pinion. Um, uh, the, the first thing to consider and the most important is that the, these components are cleaned regularly uh, and I'd recommend every 40 hours of use that they're wiped down with a rag that's got some uh, a coat of machine oil on it, uh, clean the debris off the rails and the, and the lead screws and then around the seals of the runner blocks and the um, ball nuts. And then the rack and pinion um, needs to be cleaned regularly and, and uh, greased regularly. Um, debris can build up in the teeth of the rack and cause uh, a regular wear to the rack and the pinion gear. So you want to make sure that you check that uh, again on, you know, every about every 40 hours of runtime. Um, and then you can, on the rack and pinion, you can use uh, uh, like a spray lithium grease or you can brush on some gear, uh, uh, some packing grease of some sort. Um, and then, uh, you know, to wipe the rails down, you want to use, like I said, a, a rag with some machine oil on it. And then um, if, it's a, if it's a manual lubrication system, there'll be, uh, and some of our machines have um, uh, actual manifolds that you can lubricate directly from, or uh, in the, in the uh, earlier times, there are grease certs on runner blocks and um, ball nuts. And I'll show you that real quick here. It'd be kind of hard to see, but... If you look right here, there's a grease cert that you can put a grease gun onto and you can um, put a few squirts in there every 40 hours and then run the machine back and forth to kind of spread that out. On the ball nut here, you'll see this, this kind of hole right here. Uh, there'll be a, a grease cert in there and it's the same kind of deal. You put a couple of pumps in there and then you want to kind of move the machine back and forth to kind of spread that out in, into the ball nut and out onto the screw. And then for manual lubrication or automatic lubrication systems, sorry, I'll put a, a, a visual aid up there on the screen. So here, what you want to do is uh, make sure that the lubricate, that the pump is full of oil, an adequate, has an adequate amount of oil in it. Every so often you want to check that filter, make sure it's clean of debris. Uh, we have used... Um, pumps have changed a little bit over the years and the requirements for the lubrication has changed with it. So with every pump, we put a manufacturer label on there that states what kind of lubrication needs to be put into that pump. I would always refer to that and make sure you're using the, the correct amount, the correct type of oil to put inside there. The other part to that is, um, so automatic lubrication systems are, they're PLC controlled typically, and it's based on um, distance traveled accumulatively between the linear axes X, Y, and Z. Um, so in this case, if you're, if, you know, if the machine is lubricating too little, you see that the rails are dry, the runner, um, rails and lead screws are dry, 
you'll want to um, decrease the amount of time that's set within that PLC parameter. And you can find that the um, the parameter should be discussed in the in the training and and just um, listed in the manual as far as which ones to change. And then conversely, if it's lubricating too much, you'd want to um, uh, increase the value of that parameter so that it doesn't lube as frequently. What I would add to that is um, Pete talked about using a, um, a lint-free rag to wipe down the machine. Keep that rag in a sealed bag after you've done it once and keep it near the machine as a reminder that this is a daily task. Uh, maybe with some signage, maybe not. Um, good, rem good reminder just of what you're supposed to be having your staff do on a regular basis. Um, the other parameters that Pete talked about with the automatic lube system is um, every machine that we deliver, uh, we give you a hard copy DMS manual, um, and we also give it electronically. If, if you've lost it or you don't have it, contact us. We can get it to you. But I believe it's Appendix 3 is where those parameters are outlined for the automatic lube. <clears throat> so the next area that we want to talk about is just keeping your machine clean. And you really can't do some of the things that Pete talked about um, unless you're getting all of the chips and the cast off cleared out of the way so that you can properly lube uh, either the ball nut, the runner block, or the lead screw, what have you. So um, you'd be surprised at the amount of customers that pay us to come out and be a custodian for them. And because they can't get tolerance on their parts and, you know, we... We've, we ask them on the phone whether what are the condition of the machine. Oh, yeah, it's clean. It's fine. And we go out there, and then they pay us to clean their rack and pinion and get it cleared out. So, um, you know, most customers use some type of an air gun uh, to regularly blow off the chips. Uh, do what's best for you um, when you've got to open up components and, and uh, uh, lead screw areas. Uh, vacuum often works well. Uh, to get in there and, and clean that area out and keep it clean. <clears throat> um, I think the only other thing I want to talk about is just uh, what's really important is when you have automatic tool change spindles, you want to make sure that you're keeping that, have a good cleaning maintenance for it. So not only uh, cleaning the tool holder receptacle on the spindle, but also the mating taper for... Um, you know, as it's connecting to the spindle. So you want to make sure that this is clean and rust free. And I suppose rust is probably a good segue into the next topic. Yeah. So uh, the next thing we're going to discuss is the main air system. And this is what most machines are fixed with. Uh, it's the main air regulator system. The air uh, supply comes in on this side and it runs through and then this center section here would supply direct pressure to um, solenoids, um, control valves, stuff like that. And then this regulator here on the end uh, supplies air to the counterbalance for the Z axis. Um, <clears throat> it's important on a daily basis that uh, that you check these these um, oil water separators on on the incoming line here. Um, if there's water in your system, it will collect in these. And there's a little button on here. Some of them, uh, it's a screw cap. You either unscrew it or press the button and it'll evacuate whatever uh, material is inside here. If you're collecting water in these, you might want to consider getting an air dryer system because water can be very uh, detrimental to components on the, sh on the machine, especially the spindle. So we've talked about um, a few of the areas uh, that are key for preventive maintenance. Um, and I've mentioned the manual that we supply with the machine. Um, depending on your controller, which type of controller you have, it'll either be Chapter 6 or Chapter 7 um, in that manual. That kind of is an overview and, and really just uh, a, cover, a good covering of all of the topics that we'll be touching on today. Uh, so I would certainly refer you to that. Uh, one of the questions that comes up is, well, how often should I do these tasks? And some of them are, um, the answer is daily, like checking your, uh, whether the water needs to be evacuated from that reservoir, uh, cleaning the machine, um, making sure lubrication 
isn't there, if lubrication isn't there and you don't check it daily, <clears throat> you might have some symptoms where you'll hear it uh, and it'll become obvious to you, or you might not hear anything. And day after day, week after week, your motors are then working harder. Uh, you're, you're wearing down uh, the ways, um, you know, in the lead screw. Uh, so it's important to uh, keep in mind how frequently you want to do it. If you know that you have a wet air system coming into your machine, uh, it's more important to do it maybe at the start of every shift or mandatory to have a procedure every four hours to check those reservoirs. Um, how good is your dust collection? If you don't have uh, a good vacuum for collecting the dust, then that's going to be just more debris is collecting around your machine or on your table. And the third thing I think that affects frequency quite a bit is <clears throat> what are you cutting? Um, if you're cutting abrasive material such as graphite or carbon fiber, fiberglass, composite type material, um, that's going to in introduce more wear and tear and make all of these topics even more important. Um, so you want to talk more about the counter air balance? Yeah, so we'll have a visual aid up on the screen. We're going to talk about the Z-axis counterbalance. And maintenance on that. Um, so you see in the picture on the left, there's an airline going into the counterbalance. What the counterbalance does is it alleviates the weight of the Z-axis so that the motor is not lifting the, Z, the, the weight of that assembly up and down. It's just moving. Um, it's basically just moving the axes. So in the picture on the left, there's the airline that goes in there. If you to uh, <clears throat> maintain the uh, lubrication of the cylinder, you uh, would remove air from the machine and then you'd have to bleed the pressure out of the balance tank, which typically would either be located on the back of the bridge or in the back of the machine. And then once you've released all that air, you take that air line out of there and put a few drops of air tool oil inside there. And then you can plug that line back in and repressurize the system. And that will lube the, help lube the internal components of the, of the cylinder <clears throat> and uh, seals and whatnot. And then uh, the picture on the right, we talk about the, the breather, the brass filter. So it's, it's very important that that filter stays free of debris so that it can breathe and evacuate air uh, effectively and, and allow the cylinder to operate as it's, as it's designed to do. So to clean that, you can take that out and then um, you can blow air from the threaded side to kind of evacuate debris from the filter if, if uh, if you use like a unis type system and there's kind of oil in the air that gets mixed with the debris, the cutting debris, and it kind of cakes around that, you can soak that in some kind of solvent like a lacquer thinner um, to break that up and then um, again, blow air through it. If you're unable to clean that breather, then um, it's recommended that you replace it. And those can be sourced, you know, either locally or you can um, reach out to DMS for to supply those to you. The other important part to that is the cable on that assembly. Uh, if you put the Z-axis all the way down, you can check the integrity of the coating that's on that cable. You want to make sure that there's no cracks um, or uh, any kind of wear to it or not. And then um, the other important thing to consider is that uh, the balance is set properly. Um, and if back to this kind of, this regulator here uh, supplies the balance pressure to that counterbalance. On older machines, you can uh, uh, you can check the counterbalance by putting the machine knee stop and then you know a, a simple lift and pull on the z axis. Um, it should be fairly easy to push up and it should take the same amount of pressure to bring it back down. On newer machines that have brake motors or rail brakes, you'll want to reach out to a DMS factory technician and uh, um, get their assistance in how to check those uh, recheck the counterbalance on that. As long as you maintain the uh, the cylinder, the counterbalance cylinder, you shouldn't really have any problems with the pressure, um, with having to adjust the pressure on the regulator. Um, but you'll want to check that. I'd say uh, at least twice a year, you want to check that and make sure that it's adjusted properly. Thanks, Pete. The next area we want to cover is to talk about um, the machines that might have a chiller. And so there's another um, slide we're going to go to that I'll reference. And um, the one thing you want to make sure is that the, the cooling fluid 
in this picture, it's an example of an omelet spindle cooler. Um, you want to make sure that the, the fluid level there is consistent and um, at least halfway full up to the max line. This is a closed system. So if you've got fluctuation in that level of fluid, uh, you've got a problem. You probably have a leak, and that's going to have to be addressed. Um, the other thing that you need to do with these chillers is make sure that the grill stays clean. Um, these are factory dusty environments. Um, this area gets clogged and I can't emphasize enough how important it is to delicately clean that grill. Um, we've had a lot of chillers been returned and, um, <clears throat> I don't know why the people stick screwdrivers in there to kind of bang the blades. Um, that's going to, that's going to change the alignment of the shaft. Uh, we've had customers complain about their spindle needing to be replaced and Omlot and our other vendors uh, tell us all the time about how their customers are just a little too aggressive in sticking things in there to try to clean that out. Um, you can vacuum that group that grid off. Uh, do not stick things in there. Do not try and uh, open that unit up. Um, we've had customers think they need to go in there and open that unit up. Once you open that unit up, you void the warranty. So just vacuuming it uh, gently across that grill is usually good enough. Um, the next thing I want to move to is the electrical cabinet. And I guess the first thing to talk about there is uh, the door to the electrical cabinet needs to be shut. Uh, we've walked into a number of factories uh, and let's say they're cutting carbon fiber or anything that's airborne and the door is open. Right there, you're exposing all the brains and guts of your electronics uh, to your environment and you're shortening the life of the machine. So, um, when you do want to take a look at the electrical cabinet, um, power off the machine. Uh, only when the power is off, then open that door up and make sure that it's dust free in there. If it's not dust free, take a vacuum and carefully vacuum without touching the vacuum nozzle to any of the components in there. Um, you don't want to touch any of the terminals, relays, circuit boards, any wire junctions. Um, you got to really be gentle when you're paying attention to there. Um, most electrical cabinets will have uh, an AC unit in there, and that filter is usually located on the outside of the cabinet, and that can be cleaned off, uh, vacuum the exterior like I talked about. Um, if, if you originally had purchased a machine and you might be doing woodworking, uh, and then you've switched over and now you're cutting or using that machine for something else and you don't have an AC unit, you probably want to think about getting one. Um, you need to keep the contamination out of that cabinet and the AC unit usually achieves that. But if you don't have one and you are concerned about the integrity of your electrical cabinet, um, keeping dust from getting inside that cabinet is pretty important. Um, I guess the last thing I want to mention on the electrical cabinet is on the slide, we had a picture of a typical cabinet and then um, um, another slide that shows what all those numbers mean, identification for what those components are. Important not only for you to understand what your machine is and how um, what the components are, but whenever you're talking with anybody on the phone about troubleshooting um, the more you know and are familiar to have a phone conversation with a technician, uh, the more you're going to minimize that troubleshooting time and therefore the downtime on your machine. Pete, you want to talk about spindles? Yeah, so we'll go over kind of maintenance of a spindle. Uh, <clears throat> there are two types of main spindles that we use. Uh, as far as tool holder capacity, either the HSK tool holders or the ISO 30 tool holders. We briefly showed this. So on the ISO 30 tool holders, it's very important that you clean. You make sure that your tool holders are clean and free of dust. And we're talking about this area right here on the tool holder. 
Um, you can use a rag with some machine oil on it to kind of clean that off. If there's some rust on there, you can uh, use a, a light abrasive like a scotch brighter or, or something equivalent to that to kind of clean that rust off there and then uh, wipe it down with a, a rag uh, coated in machine oil. And then uh, once it's clean and free of rust, then you could use a rag with some denatured alcohol to kind of dry it off and get any contaminants off of there. You want to do that on a regular basis. Uh, you'll also want to make sure that the, the cone inside the spindle is clean and free of rust. Um, same kind of thing. You can use a rag with some machine oil on it to kind of wipe the inside of that cone out and then use some scotch, some scotch bright to remove rust if there is any. And then uh, the rag again after that to kind of clean the uh, what you take off from the rust. And then at the, the final part of that would be um, to use a lint-free cloth with some denatured alcohol to kind of clean out uh, any kind of debris or, or uh, oil that's left inside there. You never want to blow air directly into the shaft of a spindle. It's very important on, on any model, whether it's ISO 30 or um, HSK. Now on the HSK, uh, I would just interject real quick. Back to what I was talking about cleaning as well. Certainly never blow air up into a spindle. Don't blow it into a ball nut seal, a runner block, uh, any type of a bearing uh, or electrical component. So, um, you know, you use compressed air a lot to blow and keep your machine clean, but be careful about how close that nozzle gets to some of these components. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's okay. Um, so on the HSK tool holders, uh, same kind of thing on the shaft of the tool holder. You want to make sure there's no rust on the outer rim and, and conversely on the inside, since the HSK is gripped from the inside of the tool holder, you want to make sure there's no rust or debris inside there either. Um, and it's, you know, I've been to a lot of customer sites where their tooling kind of sits out and in a dusting environment, that dust just kind of collects on those things. You want to make sure before you put those in to a machine to be used, you want to clean those off um, <clears throat> regularly and make sure they're free of debris. So something different about the HSK tool uh, spindles is this Metaflux uh, packet. This, you can, we supply this. There are other, uh, kind of uh, similar products out there that you can get to that for the same thing. You want to apply this to the cone of the, of the spindle itself and then to the draw bar claw. Um, and, uh, and obviously first you want to make sure that you clean the, you clean those out first before you apply this, you know, make sure it's free of rust, use the um, rag with machine oil and, and some scotch product to get any rust out that might be in there and then clean it out with a lint-free cloth with some um, denatured alcohol and then apply this Metaflux to those components on the inside of the spindle um, to get the draw bar down so that you can actually apply this to the shaft and the claw. You can use the M code M89 referred to the manual in the M code section, the basic M code section. It'll tell you that as well, but M M89 is the M code to send the draw bar down. You can execute that through MDI. And then use, I use a light paintbrush to apply this to the claw and then my finger or a rag to kind of apply it to the ring, um, the shaft of the spindle. <clears throat> so I think the last thing we want to talk about in this area is, uh, in terms of PM tasks, is just checking for the belts, the pulleys, uh, check for bolt tightness, uh, a general inspection again, um, if, if you're letting those things go, um, then along with some of these other things that we've talked about, if, if you allow debris to build up and now, you know, your ball nut doesn't travel the full length of the lead screw or your pulley is loose or a bolt might be coming loose, um, it's going to start affecting the operation of the machine and you're going to start seeing alignment concerns that will show up in your part. So, um, I would suggest you uh, take a look at the chapter on maintenance. Again, it's either six or seven, depending on your controller model, and have a best practice to bring that forward to your staff. You know, a lot of shops nowadays, uh, it's hard to keep the same staff, and you lose guys, and the new guys come on, and, and there's no ingrained discipline for best practice of the, some of these PM ideas. So take action as the owner of the machine, protect your machine and put some visible reminders up about the PM tasks. 
um, checking the bolts, the pulleys, uh, the bolt tightness, uh, some of these other things we've talked about. Um, if you don't, then you get into more serious uh, problems with your concern with your machine. Um, that's when you have to call the professionals. So DMS, uh, if you don't want to do this PM, um, I would advise you that there's a minimal amount of PM that you should be doing to protect your machine. But if you just wanted to get caught up, you know, we do sell a one day PM on a three axis machine and on a five axis machine, it's a two day package. And that second day uh, will come out and uh, do the alignment of the fourth and fifth axes on your spindle. Um, if you want to do that yourself, we'll give you the uh, instruction packet for how to do the nine step procedure. Um, if you don't want to take that on yourself, uh, it is included in the second day of the PM service that we do offer. Anything else you want to say about alignments? You know, one thing I like to discuss is uh, just cover is the rack and pinion. Uh, we use on, on the majority of our machines, we use what's called a floating gear system. And that, so that the motor that holds the pinion gear is uh, spring loaded and it's allowed to float across the rack so that if there's any imperfection in the alignment of the rack, that pinion gear can move out with it and not, um, and it, it kind of improves the wear of the rack over time. What can happen is that, that the, the components can fall out of alignment or adjustment or become uh, compacted with debris and it doesn't allow that, that pivoting motion, right? And if that happens, then um, it can cause regular wear to the rack. I've seen that happen quite a few. So I'd say, you know, on a monthly basis, you'll want to check and make sure that that system's still working as it's supposed to. What you can do to kind of test that is there's usually a black, a plastic cover on the column there where the motor is hidden behind. You can take that cover off and in between the the motor and the, um, the, the pivot plate that the motor is mounted to and the actual truck plate, you can put a pry bar on there and just kind of pry on it and make sure that that, that spring should, it should allow it to flex. There should be some, some, you know, amount of pressure on there, but you should be able to still see flex. If there's no movement at all, then something has to be done to improve that, the integrity of that system. And that, in that case, I would call, recommend calling a DMS factory technician and make sure you get some advice on how to make that adjustment. Okay. Right. What, Question and answers? Yeah. Let's okay. Do that. So um, I also know that people are asking about that PM packet. So I told them we'd send it out Look to the register links right here. Yeah. Uh, the, the PM option, we have a whole description of uh, what the one-day service, uh, what it costs, what are all the uh, things that we do, um, and then the two-day package as well. So Yeah, but also the packet, you said they were giving instructions on how to do the Oh, the fourth and fifth alignment? Yeah. 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 So if you call um, the uh, into the service department um, and talk to anybody who answers the phone um, and ask about the fourth and fifth alignment procedure, we can email that to you. So that's how you get your hands on that. Okay. So first question um, was asked uh, by uh, David Steven Stevens. I'm sure it's just David Stevens. He says, I've been breaking the Zerk fittings. My buddy with the DM machine also broke his. They rip out of skate. Do you have a solution for that? Six. <clears throat> so there are some uh, greasers that we started using that have a longer uh, threaded shaft on them. Um, there was a change that was made to uh, the some of the supplied runner blocks that we get where the um, there's a recess in that fitting. We didn't, um, as soon as we caught it, we started... Uh, replacing them with longer with these greasers that have longer threads on them. Um, we have those here in house, um, or they can be sourced locally too. I can get you the specs on those, and we'll uh, when he sends out the blast with the links and all that kind of stuff. I'll make sure that I include that in there. Okay. <clears throat> hey, uh, second question is from uh, Christopher England. <clears throat> he asks for greasing ways for greasing. For greasing ways and lead ball uh, screws, how much is enough or too much? Using the DMS supplied yellow grease gun, it seems like the component either feels dry, no lube, or it is dripping off the X and Z on the work surface. He has an FMT 5x10 3 axis. Should I be using a different grease, lithium, silicone, or heavier grade, 
Also, how much should I worry about cleaning out the deep grooves in the lead screw? Uh, so first, let's talk about how much grease is enough or too much. Um, so for with the FMT machines, we supply a grease gun. Um, that grease is kind of ideal. Um, we used to recommend lithium grease. Um, and I actually prefer the FMT grease over the lithium grease because it's less, uh, it's a little more viscous and it'll spread out a little bit easier um, on the lead screw. Um, and like I said, every 40 hours of runtime, you really only need to put a pump or two into a block. But make sure that, you know, after you do that, you kind of run it back and forth and let it spread out over the lead screw and get uh, work through the, the bearing that you're uh, applying it to. Um, for manual systems, um, also we talked about 40, you know, every 40 hours you want to, uh, that rag that's coated in machine oil that Greg says to put by the machine in the bag, yeah, it's, you know, it's a good idea to wipe down the rails with that. And that will keep a light film of grease on there as well. Um, you certainly don't want to put so much grease in there that's dripping out. You know, having grease on your parts uh, in a lot of cases isn't a, uh, a good thing or a desired thing. Um, the problem I've seen with lithium grease is it's just too thick and it doesn't spread out very well. Um, <clears throat> and for a lead screw on a manual system on the FMTs, as, as I said, that um, yellow grease is good for that. And a, and a rag with machine oil, is it's also good to wipe that screw down with that, and that'll leave a coat of, of oil on there. You don't want debris building up in the tracks of the lead screw. That's uh, um, That can cause a regular wear to the, the ball nut uh, and bearings, and which over time will affect linear accuracy and um, uh, increase backlash, that sort of thing. So you want to make sure that, you know, like that every – that and, and we have a PM schedule in the manual too. It, talk, it talks about different time frames. That every 40 hours, you want to make sure that, you know, as you're wiping things down, that you're making sure that there's no buildup of debris on, you know, any of the um, guide surfaces, uh, lead screws or rails or any kind of stuff like that. Going back to the end of this question about um, should I worry about cleaning out the deep grooves in the lead screw? Yes, you should. Um, you, your track on that lead screw, uh, you have other tracks that might not be getting used. And, and, and as the lubrication falls away and fills up that other groove, uh, you might say, well, I'll just leave it there. But that's going to attract all of the other chips and the cast off, and it's going to cause you more problems in the long run. So uh, I think a lot of machine owners fail to appreciate this is a hassle doing these PM tasks. But... You know, it's just like owning a car, right? Take care of it, do the regular checkups, um, whether you have the dealer do it or do it yourself. But if you don't do it, you're going to have larger problems down the road. Okay. Um, uh, somebody asked about uh, calibration. Uh, when will calibration training be available? That should be one of the next webinars we do, I think. We'll yeah, know. maybe that's uh, yeah, another we can, we can. calibration webinar training that we could do. Um, if you can't wait until we get around to that, um, call in, uh, the service number is 855-266-5063. I'm sorry. I just realized I should have had a slide for that. 855. 855-266-5063. Uh, for any of your needs, uh, we can customize some training and we can figure out, you know, in today's world, whether... We do it the traditional way, uh, whether we fly to your site and we train your staff on your machine is usually the, the most effective way. Uh, sometimes uh, if you want to stay with a more less costly approach and avoid some of the travel costs, um, you can come here to the DMS factory. We offer uh, a week long training on three axis machining, uh, not only calibration, but the whole nine yards of you know, how are you going to design your product? How are you going to introduce that program onto your controller? How are you going to cut it? How are you going to hold down the part? Um, or a, uh, another uh, week training on five axis machining. Uh, but whatever your uh, training needs are, um, we could also uh, arrange to do something, you know, virtually via a Zoom meeting or MS Teams, whatever uh, tool works for your, your company. And then somebody asked how much is it, but they should call in, right, to find out. 
before the, the three cents. How much is a three axis PM? Do you have a price sheet for that? Uh, a three axis PM is eighteen fifty, and I believe the two day for the five axis is three thousand one hundred and fifty. Okay. All right. The next question is: Where is the drain plug on the chiller? So there really isn't a drain plug on the chiller. Um, <clears throat> if you if you want to cycle the old fluid out and put new fluid in, the best thing to do there is is to get a length of five sixteenths tubing and plug it into the out port of the chiller, and then leave the other line plugged into the rest of the system, and then use the pump of the chiller to push out all the fluid in the system, and then until the pump is dry, and then once it's dry, you can re you can add. Uh, introduce new fluid to it and don't 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 hook up that setup and then walk away <laughs> yeah make right. sure you got a bucket obviously to drain the old fluid into yeah don't let it run dry <clears throat> okay um the next question nick uh, es uh Espos esposito asks i have two different fmt machines ralph pole told me they run on different greases two fmt machines well, so in the early days of FMT and just like DMS, we used lithium grease was kind of the standard and it was really kind of uh, what was more commonly available back then. Um, we use a different style of grease right now and I will include that, uh, so the part number information for that grease. It does require a special gun, just so you know. Um, but so when he sends out the email blast, I'll include that information as well. Um, we use that grease now because like I said, it's a little more viscous. It will spread out easier. Um, lithium grease tends to build up, uh, faster. It collects, uh, it collects dust and then it won't spread out in the runner block or out onto the rail. The stuff we're using now, uh, is a much better solution. It can be used on both machines. Yeah. He says later in the next question, um, down is my older machine uses your DMS yellow grease, my, the newer machine I use. Uh, stay lube ultra white mm -hmm. uh, this is a machine with a with grease manifolds yeah and that so the grease that the the grease that we're using today it can be used across all machines uh it works better in the machines that with the manifolds on it than the lithium grease does um so like i said uh the part number that we'll send out will is a grease that can be used across all machines yeah. all, all ages of machines all right. Next question is on auto lube machines. Is it a good idea um, to also add a light coat of grease to the rails and screws? With an auto lube system, I, I, the as far as the light coat, the the rag with the machine oil is really just to wipe down the screw and to get debris off of it and any kind of buildup. The uh, you don't necessarily need to leave a coat on there. The auto lube system does a pretty good job of coating the rails. Um, it. Uh, there's a balance there though. It's, it, you know, if you set the, uh, the lubrication too low and you're, you're outputting too much grease, it can, you, it can cause dripping and stuff like that. Um, you know, so talk about like, we don't, we don't know what the right setting is when we ship the machine. Right? Well, yeah, it's based, you know, so the setting is we kind of pick a generic value for that. It really depends on how much the machine is going to run. Right. So if you're running high production, then you're, that value is going to be a lot bigger because, the machine's running a lot more. It's going to cycle a lot more times. The loop pump's going to cycle a lot more times in a day. Whereas a machine like a pattern maker might cut a pattern or two in a day. <clears throat> and the machine's not running, you know, maybe four to six hours out of the day. It's not going to cycle a lot um, throughout the day. So that number's going to be a little bit lower. So it's kind of, you got to fine tune that. And that's something that should be talked about in the, um, you know, in the machine setup. The tech should cover that a little bit um, and how to, how to adjust those parameters. And then there's also a manual function of that. Uh, there's it's M code actuated, can be M code actuated. And then there's also a primer button on the pump itself. If you need to, if you don't feel like you're getting enough lube and you want to get some out there while, uh, while at the same time, considering the value of that parameter, you can um, manual actuate the lube to get it out there at the same time. Same as I talked about before, when you're pumping grease in the block or you're running the auto lube system, the, what we do here when we prime, the systems uh, during the finishing process is we have a program that moves that machine to the extent of the travel of all the axes. And then we run the lube at the same time so that we're coating the rails, we're coating the rudder blocks, um, coating the lead screws, making sure all that's getting done. 
And then, you know, and sometimes we do it to the point where it is dripping right after the fact. And you got to keep running it some more to kind of get it worked out and make sure you get all the drips off um, and then kind of wipe it down. Um, that's a pretty good practice on a, uh, you know, a 40 hour schedule is to make sure that the loop system is functioning properly, that you're getting lube out to every, uh, every component on the machine that's supposed to supply lube to. And then, uh, you know, and it, and that will pretty much do a, a decent job of coating the, the rail surfaces and whatnot that you don't have to worry so much about um, going back over it with a rag and spreading it out. Okay. And it's, it's a balance, right? Um, you don't want your ways to be dry, but you don't want oil or grease dripping on your product. Um, so, you know, that's what drip trays are for as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you don't have the adequate drip, drip trays, yeah, you might look at investigating that. All right. Uh, next question is by uh, from Rudolph Olson. Uh, he says, having trouble with the left table going into the machine. Have to grease the table every day. The actuator solenoid inside the box that is inside the machine has been changed. The table will start to go in then slowly stop before going all the way in. Not sure where to, where to look next. Um, I, so I feel like uh, in that situation, I would look at, um, I would start looking at the runner blocks uh, and maybe a misalignment in that, a cylinder misalignment. Um, it, it's air driven. Um, and it sounds like the lube, you know, lubing it every day is, is kind of helping the situation, but um, it, yeah, it sounds like there's, there's some kind of an alignment problem that, um, is creating a lot of resistance as that moves in and out. It could be a alignment problem in the cylinder. It could be runner blocks, runner block related. There could be bearing issues. Um, that question there sounds to me like um, that you should call in and speak to a factory technician so that we can go through some, uh, some, yeah, some troubleshooting. Uh, yeah, he doesn't mention about any error codes on the controller. So I'm assuming that, well, if it's an air-driven table, the machine's not detecting any problems. Well, as long as the table gets in and out, it's satisfying the logic, right? So there's no, there's nothing really in an air-driven system. There's nothing really to monitor the table, the movement from um, start to stop. You know what I'm saying? It's only when it gets into position that it monitors that. Now, now if it takes a lot of time to get in, then the the PLC will generate an error saying that there, you know, some kind of a obstruction yeah well right? I, but, I, I don't know whether it goes all the way in or not he kind of mentions that it stops before it goes all the way in but if the machines if it's not enough of a failure of a distance to travel for the controller to detect it or the plc then yeah we need more troubleshooting probably to speak with the technician call, call in that number all right so the uh next question um is what are the uh, this is from uh, uh adrian straight what are the possible reasons why the spindle would get stuck when dropping off switching a tool? On occasion, the machine says waiting for a drawbar, and then sometimes the tool needs to be manually ejected. I try to keep debris off the tool holders during the machining. It can't always be there to keep it clean during running. So this, I'd have to assume this is HSK spindle, and I'll say that the problem is more prevalent with HSK. They require... Uh, a lot more accuracy when picking up and dropping off tools. Part of that could be air pressure. Um, and we have found that uh, the higher air pressure, we used to um, recommend that there was a minimum pressure of 90 PSI in our older machines. Once we started using more HSK models, uh, we found that a higher air pressure is better. So I would certainly look into what your the static pressure is in the shop and what the pressure on the machine is. Um, I'd recommend, you know, at a, at a minimum 100 PSI for an HSK type system. The other part to that is if there's any kind of misalignment in the in the tool rack, in the tool change process, that can affect how effectively the, the spindle comes down on to the tool in alignment and, and picks this tool up. Um, there, like I said, there's a lot more forgiveness in an ISO 30 taper versus an HSK. Um, so I look at those two things, air pressure and rack alignment. If, if you're doing a good job of keeping the, the tools, the tool holders clean, and then you're using this uh, lubrication in the spindle and doing regular maintenance on the spindle, then your, your likely culprit is either air pressure or alignment, rack alignment. 
Yeah, and I, I would add to that, uh, it's it, it's often a, the story is what you don't know, right? And so if the, if the movement of the machine is not operating the way it should be, what's happened in the past? And, you know, you, you might not be aware of any crashes on the machine. Just because you're not aware doesn't mean the crashes on the machine didn't occur, right? And if you've had a crash, then the alignment of the rack might be out. The spindle fingers might have scorch marks on it. Uh, you may have just no crash, but you're just running that really aggressively on the spindle. Um, and that can affect, you know, um, the movement of all those metal parts as it's picking up and dropping off. Okay. Uh, next question is by Rudolph again. How much fluid does a spindle chiller hold? I think that goes back to the question when, we, when people want to replace it. How much fluid should it have? Yeah, so on the Omlot style too, uh, spindle chillers, typically we put one gallon of fluid in there. There is a, a, a minimum and max, uh, or sh should be a minimum and max line on that um, indicator on the side of the chiller. As long as you're, you got to be above the minimum. Um, like I said, on the omelets, and depending on the bit, the size of the machine, um, one gallon is typically enough. On the chillers, we put in uh, the, the, the chillers, and I say it like a heat exchanger. Uh, the omelet is a heat exchanger, and then chillers, we use Idea chillers. Those hold um, typically two gallons of chill of fluid. Okay. As long as you're within, you know, usually within the middle of of the the min and max line, you're you should be good. The next question is by uh, from uh, Darlin Henry. Uh, is there an internal clock that can tell how many hours a machine has been running? We have two FMT four by eights and do a lot of wood MDF material at around fifty hours a week. Just wanted to know rough life span, 5, 10, 15 years, et cetera. So the life of the machine can, uh, it, it really kind of revolves more around how well it's taken care of. Obviously, there are components on the machine um, that can wear out. But um, it, as some of you might know, the history of DMS, uh, the owner, uh, the original owner, Patrick Bowler, his dad owned Motion Master. We, and, and there are Motion Master machines out there. And DMS was built based off of, kind of like um, the bowlers trying to expand on and improve the motion master um, legacy. Right. But there's motion masters that are out there that are 20, you know, over 20 years old that are still running. You take good care of them and they'll take good care of you. There is um, time tracking capabilities of the machine. We don't typically enable that um, for most customers. If you would like something like that, it would require a PLC upgrade. You can call in for that. Um, we can put it on there. There's different things that we can monitor, spindle, runtime, machine runtime, you know, whether it sits idle, you know, you, you name it. We have a list of, of things that you can um, pick or choose from. Um, if you just call into us, uh, the service line, uh, you can get information on that. And just real quick note about Motion Master. Um, two separate companies, um, DMS, uh, because of the concerns about uh, the different safety standards now, um, you know, you, you build CNC machines and we build cars now that are much safer than they were in the past. So if you do have any motion master needs, um, DMS does not do service or um, uh, any type of advice for motion master. So if you do have motion master concerns, I would recommend calling a company called CNC Parts out of California. All right. Uh, next question is uh, from Blake. I oversee three different DMS machines for an aerospace company focusing on CNC, um, machining uh, composite parts, fiberglass, um, and honeycomb. Each machine has adequate dust collection, but could be better. We work 24 hours, five days a week. Does PM need to perform more frequently than a recommended 40 hours, assuming that um, this is standard for machining metals? What would you recommend being the minimum amount of PM tasks should be required air hose accessible? Um, I think 40 hours is still a good rule of thumb. Obviously, you're going to produce uh, more operate, operating hours in a week, uh, working three shifts versus one shift. Um, so just, you'll just come faster. Yeah, you'll, you know, on, so if you're working 24 hours a day, obviously you're going to PM that machine. You're going to do the 40 hour PMs, you know, multiple times in a week versus, uh, you know, a, a company that works 
um, only one shift, but the, you should, if you, you should still be able to follow the, um, the maintenance guidelines in the manual as far as when to perform those tasks and how frequently. Okay. Uh, David Stevens came with another question here. I, I do want to mention everybody, we have eight more minutes um, left in this. So I'll try to get to as many questions as we can. If you keep, I see people type in, but uh, David uh, Stevens asks, I have a four axis Patriot. The fourth axis will get out of square by about three degrees. I.e. the four jaw chucks will not be plumped to the bed after running a file. I tried to change the parameter. It seems to work, but not for long. Thanks. So I'd have to say that there's probably something mechanically wrong with that system. Um, so typically that's a direct drive. The motor mounts to the gearbox. The gearbox turns the chuck. If the coupler that joins the motor to the gearbox is loose, it'll allow that shaft to spin independently of the gearbox. Uh, and, and that can happen when there's a load, like when you're machining something, you're putting a little bit more load on it and it can cause what looks like a little bit of drift. Um, I would certainly look into that um, first. Uh, and if it's, and it depends on the system. I mean, um, it could be a servo problem, but to me, it sounds like you said you, you can align it, it works. And then you run a part and then you have problems. Um, my, my inclination is to think that uh, we want to look at mechanics first. Um, and if you need, need be calling the service line and we can give you some assistance on looking into that. Um, and then David asked about the Zerks, but you did answer that question and, uh, David will be sending the recording out. Uh -huh. Um, that's all the questions I have right now, but I see there's two people or three people are typing. Um, so I'll just wait to see if there's any questions. Uh, uh, Leonard asks, we have an FMT 4x8 that we run a lot of quick programs on, on a very repetitive occasion, uh, very repetitive occasionally. We will get a spindle server error message. We have to power down it for a couple of minutes to clear the code. Any idea what, what the cause? So in, uh, in that case, so you don't have to power down the machine at let me just say, um, the most important thing there, there's some troubleshooting that needs to be done here. It, um, <clears throat> so when that error comes up, the error on the screen is pretty, is kind of generic. It's really just telling you to look at the inverter. What I would highly recommend is that as soon as that error pops up, look at the inverter on the display of the inverter, it's going to show a code. Um, that code, you can call us and tell us what that code is. We can look it up in the manual. Um, there should have been a manual that came with a machine. You can look it up yourself too. And that'll give us a little more insight into what's going on. It sounds like it might be a temp problem, but it's hard to say. Like I said, the, the error that you see on the CNC is really just kind of telling us to look at the inverter and see what the inverter is telling us. So it's important in this case to, for us to know what that code is. But like I said, you don't have to power down the machine. Um, once you've, looked at the inverter and written down the code there's a reset button on there you can reset that that'll reset the air and then you can um start operation again <clears throat> and just to, uh, perhaps obvious right but anytime you reference something that is being done in a program is different than when we're doing it manually well have we looked at the program right um, obviously you know is there a dwell there that's causing the delay is there a sequence of commands that the machine is taking longer to interpret because of, um, I would also look at what the program has in it. Sure. All right, Steve Cox asks, and again, we have four more minutes left. Uh, we have a five axis BMS machine, and when we do a tool change with an M code, it works good, but when a tool change is done in a program, it is slower. Any idea why this is? So that is uh, likely related to different modes, right? So an M code um, is, I assume you execute through MDI, um, that's one mode. Uh, and then through a program is another mode. Um, and the tuning on the machine is kind of done in modes, right? So there's 
the tuning that's done for automatic mode or executing programs so that the machine uh, runs smoother, uh, a little more concise, um, and, you know, improved toolpath and stuff like that. The um, jog mode or MDI mode would, would be tuned a little bit differently. It might be a little bit softer. Um, you know, so if, if, if it's something you'd like to do something about, I, I'd call in to the service line. We can do some uh, different kind of tuning techniques on it to improve the, the speed of that in the execution mode. Um, but that would be the, the, the underlying cause. All right, the next question is, I got an email for the new 2.0 line of FMP 4x8 machines a while ago. I was wondering when those will, uh, will be coming out. They look great. So they are available now. Um, and as a matter of fact, the old style FMTs um, will run out of production here pretty quickly. As soon as we use up the remaining components that we have um, to build those machines, um, they'll be discontinued and then the only thing that will be available is the newer FMTs. Um, like I said, you can call in now and buy those if you want to. Um, and there's a very limited number of the old styles left. Uh, and I think three of them are sold. And then we have enough to do two more after that. And then you'll see nothing but the new style. So Pete, it's the new style is, for example, one of the changes is going to be, we're going to standardize on some footprints. And as far as the controller, we're, we're not going to be selling 8037s anymore. We'll be moving to an 8055. Only. Correct. No, um, actually, it's going to be an 8070 OL controller, which is a touchscreen controller. Uh, the user interface is pretty nice. Uh, it's a touchscreen. It's Windows and it's a Windows embedded system. Um, so Windows runs in the background. The controller runs over top of it, typically. Um, <clears throat> and it's a pretty nice system. But that's the 8037s will no longer be available after that. And I, I don't want to say that it's possible they might make an exception. But. All right. Uh, the last question is, uh, how often are you supposed to re-grease the Zerks on running blocks for a five-axis machine? Every 40 hours runtime. Every 40 hours. Yep. Okay. Well, that's it. That's our time. You want to say um, Thanks, everybody, for dialing in. We'll uh, send this out um, so that you can have this information and listen to it again if you want. Um, again, apologies for, uh, I didn't have the, uh, sales number either. Uh, so, but just call in the service number and they can shoot you over to sales. If you have any inquiries about the new FMT lines or any other machines that we have. Thanks everybody. Bye.